Welcome everyone. We will get started in just a minute here. Thank you for joining us today. Good morning, everyone. Thank you so much for joining us all today. My name is Emily Musel, and we are pleased to have you with us. Um, I am mindful of the time, and so we are going to get started. Um, in front of you, you will see several tips about how to operate WebEx. Um, we, if you have questions at any time, we will have a Q&A session at the end of today's event. You can use the Q&A window to, to ask your questions and we'll have time at the end to answer them. Additionally, if you would like to focus on the speakers, you have the option to change your layout um, to hide non-video participants or to change it throughout the presentation to grid view or to presenter view. Um, there are lots of options in the layout bubble for you, so feel free to customize those as we go on. Um, additionally, if you are having trouble connecting to hear anything, you will not have the option to unmute yourself today, so you don't have to worry about that. But if you're having trouble hearing the presenters, um, please check the speaker settings in your toolbar and make sure that they're connected to the proper device. And then finally, if you're having any questions at all that um, you would like help with troubleshooting, please send the host a message in the chat window and we will do our best to help you get connected um, to get the most out of today's experience. So without further ado, I am going to introduce today's panelists. Um, first, we have Bo Hoffman. Bo is the technology manager at Vito. Bo works with the Conversion Technologies R&D program, and his realm of expertise is in resource and energy recovery from waste streams. In this capacity, he manages a variety of projects involved in conversion of these waste streams to high value products, liquid transportation fuels, and renewable natural gas. Bo also represents the United States as a task lead in IEA Bioenergy Task 36, Materials and Energy Valorization of Waste in a Circular Economy. Additionally, we have with us today Anelia Milbrandt, a Senior Research Analyst at NREL. Anelia is a member of the Resources and Sustainability Group in the Strategic Energy Analysis Center. She leads NREL's efforts related to WTE resources, including analyses on their availability, competing uses, economic potential, and market opportunities. Anelia also leads NREL's activities related to analyzing biogas and renewable natural gas production potential from resource, energy, and market perspectives. First up today, we will start with Bo. So Bo, I'll invite you to turn on your camera and unmute yourself and we can get started. All right, uh, good morning, everybody, um, or good afternoon, depending where you are in the country. Um, I'm very pleased to, uh, to be with you today, and I want to uh, first thank everybody who has taken the time uh, to sit in on this, this webinar. We hope it will be useful as, in terms of orienting you to our program and um, you know, potential opportunities for collaboration. Um, I'm going to start with a few slides on um, the Bioenergy Technologies Office and why we are interested in organic waste and resource and energy recovery therein. Um, Anelia Milbrandt, my, my colleague, will then talk a little bit about the expertise that has been developed um, and you know, the type of expertise that you can tap into as uh, communities and local governments. And then finally, at the end of the presentation, we'll talk about the 
um, the actual technical assistance mechanism. So that's kind of the outline for today. So the Bioenergy Technologies Office um, is one of a handful of technology development offices within um, the Department of Energy's um, Office of Energy Efficiency and Renewable Energy. Um, Bioenergy Technologies Office, or BEDO, um, has a mission of developing transformative and revolutionary sustainable bioenergy and co-product technologies. Um, in this endeavor, we have five, uh, five program areas um, that span the entire value chain. So on the front end, we have um, processes and technologies for converting um, feedstocks, such as corn stover, um, energy crops, um, as well as algae. So we, we invest about $80 million annually into those programs. Um, and then sitting in the middle of the program is the Conversion Technologies Office, um, where a lot of the uh, organic waste uh, resource and energy recovery work has taken place to date. Um, since fiscal year 2019, um, we've invested about $30 million in various approaches to convert um, various organic waste streams. Um, and this also includes a um, considerable amount of analysis. And I hope that in Anelia's slides, you'll get a flavor for for what resources and data um, are available to you. Uh, we also have um, programs um, in the office related to scale up and integration. Um, the systems development and integration program um, works on scale up of technologies to pilot and demonstration scale um, size. And then we have a, um, a program focused on data modeling and analysis. And that, that supports our strategic analysis efforts, our sustainability, um, indicator identification, quantification, baselining, um, and other uh, relevant analyses. Um, next slide, please. So the term waste to energy is, is one that, uh, depending where you sit in the community, means different things. A lot of folks refer to waste to energy as incineration or anaerobic digestion. Um, and within the Bioenergy Technologies Office, we, uh, we take a, a little bit of a different view. Um, we are interested in all sorts of um, resource and energy recovery strategies. And in the context of this, we're focused on four waste streams. Um, Anelia will talk about these more shortly, but um, as a country, we produce about 77 million um, dry tons per year of uh, organic waste. Of this 77 million tons, about 27 million is beneficially used in um, applications such as anaerobic digestion, composting, or other um, energy recovery strategies. We also have a con considerable amount of congressional interest in the area. Um, over the last uh, six years or so, we've gotten um, specific appropriations call-outs to focus on these waste streams. Um, so I have a choice snapshot from one of the um, Senate uh, bills from FY19. Um, if you're interested in learning more, uh, there are two publications that we've put out in recent years, and they can go into some of these topics in a lot more detail. Next slide, please. So as an office, BEDO is interested in organic waste um, for a variety of reasons. Um, first, it is an economic and environmental liability to communities. Um, uh, Neil, if you want to just kind of click through. Um, we know, for instance, for wastewater sludge, that uh, wastewater sludge represents a considerable economic expense for, um, for mun municipalities and municipal-owned treatment works. Um, uh, in addition, um, we know as a country that about $3.3 billion is, sent, is spent on um, biosolids management. Um, if you want to keep clicking, Anelia, uh, that would be great. Um, and that is things like dewatering and drying of the sludge, um, sterilization um, so that you're eliminating pathogens, um, transportation to its end use, and ultimately the tipping fees that you may pay at landfills and compost facilities. Um, and so this $3.3 billion is spread across the economy, and each and every um, ratepayer is essentially paying it. Um, you know, in California, for instance, uh, Biosolids produced um, are transported at a median distance of 130 miles um, before their um, end use. On the environmental side, these are also um, considerable sources of greenhouse gas emissions. Um, what's shown here on the bottom right is methane emissions from these, uh, from some of these um, urban and suburban waste streams. 
Um, so between landfills, manure management, and wastewater treatment, uh, we generate uh, greater than 200 million metric tons of CO2 equivalent per year. Um, we also have um, the generation of other greenhouse gases, such as nitrous oxide, which are also very potent. So um, not only is there an economic proposition here, but there's certainly an environmental one. Next slide, please. And last but not least, um, I'd be remiss if I didn't mention the third pillar of sustainability, and that of social sustainability. Um, we know that um, historically uh, the solid waste handling facilities uh, have, have typically been cited in, um, uh, in communities of color and other disadvantaged uh, population areas across the country. Um, what's shown in the top left um, is a redlining map from um, around the time of the New Deal. And, you know, when they're classifying a neighborhood as hazardous, it's not talking about the pollution per se here, but rather some of the socioeconomic and demographic factors. Um, I'd invite, you know, anybody on this call to, uh, to look at the University of Richmond's work in this area, um, where, they've, where they've gone back and scanned these, um, uh, these redlining maps and the actual uh, surveying information for these communities. Um, in California, um, the state has put together a fantastic tool known as Cal EnviroScreen, which allows the overlaying geospatially of var a variety of economic, um, environmental, and social indicators. So related to organic waste, I've, I've shown where these solid waste handling facilities are located in the Bay Area, the percentile of waste um, that a community is having to bear, um, and other factors such as cardiovascular disease. All to say, environmental impacts are numerous from waste processing facilities, and that's not just limited to odor, noise, um, infectious disease vectors. There are, there are countless indicators that, that we need to be considering here. Um, and likewise, as we think about the next generation of resource and energy recovery uh, facilities, it's important to consider social license to operate. Um, in that regard, um, we as an office are very interested and excited uh, to partner with a variety of disciplines, um, including social scientists, anthropologists, historians, to truly understand what problems we're trying to solve in these respective communities. Um, and ultimately, that's a, a key impetus for this program, uh, which we'll touch on later. Um, with that, I'm going to transition over to my colleague, Anelia, who's going to talk a little bit about the existing research um, that, again, we hope to bring to bear through this program. Thank you, Bo. Um, can everybody hear me okay? We hear you so, great, Amelia. Thanks, Emily. Appreciate it. Uh, thanks, everyone, for joining us today. Um, it's a pleasure to be here. Uh, I will give you a, um, a brief overview of our um, uh, work that we've been doing over the years on the organic waste uh, uh, materials. And um, I would like to note that uh, the data, knowledge, and information that uh, uh, we've gathered um, uh, serve um, in the, serve as the foundation for the implementation of the waste energy technical assistance, and it actually led to um, its development. I would like to also say that um, um, to make this data, knowledge, and information accessible and used by uh, local governments is a very fulfilling experience for us uh, researchers. So thank you for being with us uh, today. I hope the slides will be advancing as they should. Sorry, bear with me. Wonderful. Uh, I would like to start by expanding um, the definition of organic waste uh, that Bo mentioned earlier. Uh, to some, these materials um, are, treat, uh, are waste and liability, um, as he noted, uh, but to others, uh, these materials are also a valuable uh, resource. Again, these resources are food waste, uh, sewer sludge, um, animal manure, and fat soils and greases. Um, uh, food waste, uh, we consider uh, materials uh, uh, discarded from uh, residential, uh, commercial entities, think of uh, restaurants, um, uh, grocery stores, um, institutional, such as educational facilities, um, hospitals, um, uh, prisons, and uh, things of that nature, as well as the industrial sources, 
uh, namely uh, food processing establishments. Um, sewer sludge is the solid uh, materials remaining after wastewater processing. And here I would like to know that um, another term um, used uh, interchangeably often is uh, uh, biosolids, which are uh, treated uh, uh, sludge uh, to remove pathogens um, and meet the standards for beneficial use in uh, disposal. Um, animal manure is the organic material containing um, uh, nitrogen, phosphorus, uh, potassium, and other nutrients uh, that is generated from uh, concentrated animal feeding operations. Um, and fat soils increases um, is a descriptive term that covers uh, animal byproducts and uh, grease from uh, food handling operations. Um, these include uh, animal fats such as tallow, um, white grease and poultry fat that are obtained from uh, slaughterhouse and livestock uh, farm waste. It also includes uh, used cooking oil um, and uh, that is generated with commercial and industrial uh, cooking operations, as well as um, a trap or intersected grease um, recovered from uh, traps installed at the sewage lines of restaurants, food waste uh, processing plants, uh, sorry, food processing plants and uh, wastewater treatment plants. I would like to note here that uh, uh, the other terms for use cooking oil and, and brown grease, uh, namely, um, you will hear me referring to, or probably you all know, <laughs> that uh, a yellow grease is another uh, term for use cooking oil, which is uh, rendered or filtered um, um, material, and it's actually a commodity uh, released by uh, rendering plants. And another one uh, is brown grease for trap or interceptor grease, uh, which again is a commodity um, a filter process type of, of material from um, rendering plants. Uh, moving on, um, our resource assessment um, of organic waste uh, indicates that um, uh, these materials have the equivalent energy content of about uh, one quad or seven uh, billion uh, diesel gallon equivalent per year. Um, this equates to about 18% of uh, 2017 uh, US on highway diesel consumption. I would like to underline um, uh, what I'm saying on highway. Um, as you know, uh, diesel is used in other um, uh, sort of sectors as well, like uh, railroad, um, uh, farm equipment and so forth. Uh, so we'd like to say that uh, uh, in this case, we estimate 18% of on highway diesel, uh, think of freight tra transportation, uh, buses and so forth. Um, about half of this potential is generated by animal manure as illustrated on the pie chart here. Uh, fog and uh, sludge contribute equally about 20% each and um, food waste uh, uh, constitute about 8% uh, of the uh, um, potential. Uh, this slide illustrates um, our effort to map uh, the geographic distribution uh, for these um, uh, waste uh, materials. Um, uh, this is just an example. Uh, we've generated similar maps for every single uh, uh, feedstock uh, that I mentioned earlier. Um, in this case, I'm showing uh, sludge, food waste, uh, yellow grease or used cooking oil and um, uh, dairy manure. Um, for the most uh, part, um, uh, as you can see, uh, for sludge, uh, um, for most uh, um, uh, fat cells and greases in food waste, um, the geographic distribution uh, follows uh, uh, population patterns. Uh, in other words, areas uh, with large population also centers uh, for large organic waste uh, generation. Um, in the case of uh, manure and some fat cells and greases, uh, namely um, animal fats, the distribution follows that of uh, animal production. Uh, moving on to um, organic waste uh, prices, uh, we conducted a study that um, estimates the prices of organic waste uh, materials and generated maps uh, by county for each individual type except uh, for fat cells and greases. Uh, this is because um, a fog doesn't show a large variation between regions. Um, if a resource has been um, commoditized, which is the case for um, some of our soils and greases like yellow grease, um, I mentioned earlier, um, uh, brown grease and um, animal fats, its price is determined by market demand. And if a resource is regarded as waste, which is for the, uh, the case for the rest of the materials, its price is driven by the cost of its um, um, disposal. Um, the top map to the right illustrates the sludge prices by county. Uh, perhaps it's a little hard to digest immediately the, um, the legend here, but I will walk you through uh, in a moment. Um, the, the communities in red, purple and, and dark blue um, indicate that uh, what we call uh, negative prices, uh, which means that the resource is free or a user could be uh, paid uh, to receive the material because it represents a disposal liability to the producer. Uh, similarly, the map uh, on the bottom shows estimate, uh, estimated prices for non-residential food waste. Um, and uh, the dark colors again represent uh, negative prices. Um, our models indicate that uh, those negative price, um, uh, prices are most likely to occur in areas 
where we have organic waste uh, disposal bans. Um, as you know, uh, states such as California, New York, uh, New Jersey, um, um, and so forth. Uh, some uh, um, individual municipalities such as Austin, Texas, uh, Boulder, and Colorado, Hennepin County, and Minnesota, and so forth, have passed organic waste bans or man mandatory organic recycling laws. Um, and when laws stipulate where and how organic waste is disposed, it can generate um, opportunities for using the materials in energy and resource recovery technologies. Um, our models also indicate that uh, negative feedstock prices are most likely to occur in areas where uh, disposal costs are also high. Um, disposal costs uh, in urban areas specifically are driven from um, transportation of waste long distances, but also um, higher landfill tipping fees. Um, not surprising, I guess, but this is what again it went um, uh, in, uh, behind the development of these maps. And especially on the non residential food waste, um, you can see clearly the negative uh, uh, prices colored again in, uh, in dark colors. Um, and, and those correspond again to the organic um, uh, waste bans that are uh, in place. And again, we have, uh, we see uh, materials that are um, at the negative um, um, sort of. Indicator. We also would like to acknowledge that uh, the formal and informal local uh, markets, um, uh, and, and those uh, indicate um, uh, existing applications such as anaerobic digestion, composting, uh, incineration, and, and so forth, uh, that they drive prices in a given area. If there's a demand for those materials, naturally, um, uh, the cost will go up. Right. Um, he would like to briefly discuss um, the disposal and utilization uh, options for uh, organic waste as they exist uh, currently. Um, a large amount of uh, these materials um, uh, is uh, uh, landfilled in the US. Um, for example, uh, food waste, uh, we believe about 57% uh, or so uh, is landfilled in the country. Uh, landfill uh, uh, represents a loss of market and energy value of these materials uh, to the economy. Um, but also a significant number of landfills are scheduled to close uh, by 2050, as illustrated in, in this map uh, in red. Um, so it's not an insignificant number. Um, these closures uh, create a, a need for investment in additional waste management options. Um, and therefore, uh, opportunities for, um, again, existing or advanced um, uh, waste trading technologies. As a reference, uh, the, the yellow or orange bubbles um, show um, um, facilities closed as of 2018, and the, uh, the blue uh, circles, uh, again, scaled by capacity, um, uh, show the closures after 2050. Composting um, is another largely utilized option uh, for organic materials. Uh, the graph to the right shows uh, the number of composting facilities by state, uh, with the states of Ohio, New York, uh, New Jersey, Florida, uh, Wisconsin, and um, a few others um, uh, leading in terms of uh, numbers, uh, total numbers of uh, composting. Um, Food banks and uh, animal feed um, are relevant to food and uh, food waste and uh, are also practiced in uh, many locations uh, across the country. Um, rendering is applicable to uh, fog. Uh, rendering plants convert uh, the raw materials such as uh, animal byproducts and, as I mentioned earlier, uh, co use cooking oil and uh, trap grease um, into valuable products. Um, and uh, these, mat these materials are used by various industries, such as um, animal feed, uh, pharmaceutical uh, products, uh, cosmetics, uh, lubricants, uh, biofuels, of course, uh, plastics, and so forth. And um, another option um, is uh, for utilization of organic waste is the energy recovery, um, which I will cover in the next slide. Uh, in general, uh, the energy recovery options, uh, uh, we can um, divide them for those for the purpose today uh, in uh, commercial applications and advanced applications. Um, anaerobic digestion um, is a very widely um, established uh, process uh, worldwide, uh, which uh, produces uh, power, produces heat, uh, pipeline quality gas, um, renewable um, compressed natural gas and liquefied natural gas, as illustrated in the graph uh, to the right. It also produces a uh, valuable byproduct, uh, uh, digestate, which could be used in uh, as organic fertilizer, animal bedding, um, and uh, um, other uh, products. And biogas itself also could be used as a uh, byproduct feedstock. Um, incineration, um, we have, um, uh, again, it's also, um, as you know, uh, practiced in the U.S. We have about, I believe, uh, 70 or so uh, incinerators in the country. Um, and uh, that's been sort of a, um, a steady over the last 25 years or so. Um, there were, um, I believe in Florida was the last uh, uh, incinerator that was built, uh, again, during that time frame in 2015 or so. 
um, uh, so we haven't seen really much uh, movement in that in that field, uh, but it produces uh, power. Um, it produces um, uh, combined heat and power as well. Uh, another option uh, for energy recovery is the production of biodiesel from fat soils and greases. Uh, we have um, about 100 or so biodiesel plants um, in the country, uh, and they're producing. Um, uh, in addition to soybean oil, again, they're using fat soils and greases, primarily um, yellow grease. Uh, we use cooking oil filtered and rendered, um, and uh, uh, to some extent, animal fats. Um, another option um, is uh, the traditional hydro treating that is used um, in petroleum refineries. Um, and uh, through that process, uh, we can produce uh, what we call a drop in a renewable diesel, a jet fuel, and heating oil, uh, which means that it's uh, fully compatible with the conventional uh, fuels and can be used in any blends or 100%, as opposed to biodiesel. Uh, which again, if you're using it um, in fuels, um, in blending above 20% um, with conventional fuel, it requires um, modification to the engine. Uh, so again, for a hydro process uh, uh, fuel, you might have heard a term HEFA uh, fuel. Um, uh, those are again, uh, uh, ready to use in, in any um, um, sort of uh, ratio. Uh, another option that we've also seen um, uh, used uh, in recent years is pyrolysis or um, a heating of organic material in the absence of oxygen, which produces uh, biochar, uh, and biochar is a very viable product as a soil amendment. Moving on to uh, advanced applications, um, hydrotreated liquefaction, or HTL for short, uh, is a process that our colleagues at the Pacific Northwest National Laboratory have been working extensively um, and have achieved that uh, they have a pilot uh, scale um, uh, unit on site. Um, um, and these materials produce uh, uh, bio oil or bio crude. Um, uh, sorry, this process produces bio oil or bio crude uh, that can also produce uh, renewable um, uh, or drop in diesel, uh, gasoline, and jet fuel. The bio oil could be upgraded, upgraded to hydrocarbon fuels um, in short. Um, well, AD um, in the most basic form um, is very well uh, established in deployed technology. Um, there are possibility for advancing state of the art uh, through several processes uh, that they listed here and, and strategies. Um, uh, NREL and other uh, uh, DOE laboratories are working uh, towards improving the yield, uh, performance of anaerobic digestion, uh, valorizing byproducts, but also creating new products uh, uh, from this uh, process. All right. Um, here, I would like to mention that uh, at Enra, we have been also performing um, a techno-economic analysis, um, and uh, including anaerobic digestion. Uh, TEAs identify key uh, cost drivers, um, they identify uh, technical challenges um, uh, that industry encounters, uh, and the most critical uh, performance targets uh, for a given pathway or a process to evaluate its uh, economic viability. Uh, the graph to the right shows uh, an example of how we look at the system, in this case, uh, wastewater treatment plants, um, AD design, um, in examining all individual components in terms of the yield uh, and cost to support decision making. Uh, the graph to the left illustrates um, and compares uh, biogas, uh, biogas yield for various feedstock as reported in literature versus um, uh, theoretical yield. Um, as you can see, swine manure has the lowest uh, biogas yield as compared to other ways. Um, uh, due, this is due to the high quality of non-fermentable components such as ash um, in the feed. Uh, fat cells and greases uh, in food waste are high strength substrate, uh, substrates that they're, um, uh, and that's the reason why they're um, very much desired for co-processing uh, with manure and sludge uh, to boost uh, uh, biogas yield. Um, I would like to know that many factors uh, uh, need to be taken into account to ensure successful AD application, um, and some affect the cost, while others uh, influence the biogas productivity. Uh, therefore, as we look at the system um, and we build this techno-economic analysis, a balance between different uh, these two different factors um, uh, need to be achieved in order to, uh, again, uh, make sure that uh, a unit is operating um, as it should. Um, we have also completed uh, recently a, a cost-benefit analysis of uh, food waste, uh, disposal and utilization pathways. Um, we have generated uh, uh, results at state level, but uh, uh, we can, uh, I'd like to know that our models are very flexible. Um, we can generate at any geographic level, at county and uh, on site. And we've also generated um, uh, this type of uh, results at various capacity. Um, our focus was on those five uh, main uh, pathways and various uh, sub-pathways uh, sub as illustrated here, uh, namely uh, landfilling, uh, which includes uh, flare, um, business as usual, in our case, um, electricity, uh, combined heat and power, 
um, compressed natural gas and pipeline injection. Uh, composting includes a windrow, in vessel, and aerated static pile. Anaerobic digestion we divided in two um, uh, separate uh, uh, types: uh, dry, uh, which is uh, or high solids uh, AD, which process feedstock with greater than um, 15 to 20 percent, and wet AD, uh, which process um, uh, organic feedstock with uh, less than 15 or, or 20 percent. Um, uh, solids um, and uh, similarly to landfill, we have the same um, what we call sub pathways: uh, flare, electricity, uh, combined heat and power, uh, compressed natural gas, and pipeline injection. Uh, we also looked at incineration, uh, namely um, electricity pathway and uh, uh, compressed uh, sorry and combined um, heat and power. And for HTL or hydrothermal liquefaction, uh, uh, we're looking at uh, again bio crude uh, production and the opportunity to upgrade it to um, various hydrocarbons. Um, the uh, graph to the right illustrates a partial um, undefined results of this analysis because the, the work is um, unpublished, uh, but the actual results, real results, um, I just can't uh, specify them um, uh, because, again, they're not um, uh, publicly available yet. Um, but I would like to walk you through uh, what these, um, again, two graphs that have been combined um, uh, for easy sort of comparison I mean. Uh, the brown and green colors um, on the negative uh, side illustrate uh, the pathway costs, uh, namely capital and uh, operating um, uh, operation, operation and uh, maintenance costs. Um, the values on the positive side indicate uh, pathways benefits or profits, um, such as uh, tipping fees, uh, which are marked in pink, um, and uh, product revenues and credits, uh, which are marked in orange, uh, red, and blue. Uh, the black dot uh, represents a uh, net present value, uh, which determines um, the um, the value of all cash flow generated by a pathway and is used to establish the profitability of a pathway. A positive uh, NPV indicates an attractive pathway, uh, which is the case for all large scale uh, pathways um, that is shown in the graph. And conversely, a negative uh, NPV um, uh, shows uh, less profitable pathways as shown for all small scale pathways. I would like to know that um, this is just a small set of examples. Uh, in our results, actually, we have positive NPV for some small scale pathways and negative NPV for some uh, large scale facilities. Um, the main uh, takeaway from this graph and our analysis results um, is that for a pathway to break even, it requires a tipping fee, um, not surprising again, a facility of particular scale, as illustrated here on the graph, uh, larger facilities able to offset um, the costs easier. And um, another um, uh, sort of a, a component or factor is uh, revenue streams and credits um, uh, associated with the product sales. Um, naturally, results vary um, uh, by capacity. Um, uh, this is just an, exa uh, an example of two capacity sizes, um, and we have generated uh, many more. Uh, in geographic locations, um, uh, geographic variances stems from uh, differences in tipping fees, uh, fuel energy prices. Again, they have a very specific uh, regional pattern um, and, of course, um, local wages. Um, we have also been busy on the market and policy side. Um, we performed a hotspot analysis, uh, which uh, integrates information on organic waste resource potential, uh, prices, um, uh, fuel consumption, uh, local market uh, fuel prices, and uh, available policies. Um, and uh, uh, we use this information to identify areas with the best potential for developing advanced um, uh, waste energy um, technologies. We also monitor and evaluate existing biogas, biodiesel, and renewable diesel plants. Um, at the map to the right here shows the existing biogas plants for, um, uh, and it includes uh, food waste locations or dedicated food waste um, uh, uh, type of facilities. Um, also uh, landfill uh, gas projects, um, um, also manure digesters in um, uh, locations at the, or digesters at the uh, wastewater treatment plants. Um, and we use this information to stay abreast on, on uh, market developments. Um, I didn't mention incineration again because uh, we have, again, it has been somewhat steady uh, during the past uh, um, uh, 25 years, but we still evaluate um, its performance um, in terms of uh, um, uh, material consumption and um, um, power generation. Um, we also uh, pay uh, close attention to uh, renewable energy certificates. Um, uh, the, we have evaluated the uh, REX uh, market rules and policy changes. Um, as you know, these are pretty fluid, so we need to um, uh, keep an eye on those. Um, we also provide guidance on claims that organizations can make from uh, the purchase and sale of um, uh, REX. Uh, we also help organizations understand pathway for purchasing uh, REC products. Um, similarly, uh, we also analyze uh, renewable identification numbers, or RINs for short, um, 
uh, for renewable uh, fuels that are generated under the um, uh, renewable fuel standard uh, program um, and also the uh, California low carbon fuel standard um, um, by uh, looking at um, again paying attention to uh, historic current uh, generation uh, prices uh, sales and so forth uh, we've also summarized the existing practices and regulatory standards for handling and disposal of organic waste uh, in the US um, and um, a key finding from this work is that um, except for several types of uh, fat soils and greases, all the materials considered in this work, uh, sludge, manure, and food waste, are conventionally viewed um, and handled as waste. Uh, management standards are defined at the federal level um, and allow states or local entities the ability to adopt um, um, federal standards uh, or develop stricter rules. An example here is the map uh, um, to the right for sludge disposal regulations. Uh, the light uh, blue color uh, uh, shows the, um, uh, the same as the federal standard set by the EPA. Uh, the darker blue illustrates uh, locations uh, where uh, states have implemented a uh, pollutant or pathogen limits uh, stricter than the federal standard. And the darker blue indicates states where the management practices are stricter than those outlined in the federal standards. Um, regarding uh, socioeconomic um, analysis, um, annual develop uh, uh, the, uh, the jobs and economic uh, development impact, JEDI, uh, very cool name uh, for short. Um, these uh, models um, estimate uh, the economic um, impact of uh, constructing and operating renewable energy plants at the local and state level. Um, based on uh, user uh, entered uh, project specific data, or we can use also um, uh, input uh, uh, default inputs that are defined by um, uh, industry norms. Uh, JEDA estimates the number of jobs and economic impacts uh, to a local area that, that can reasonably be supported by a new facility. Uh, for example, um, here the JEDI uh, model estimates the number of jobs um, uh, from a new um, uh, hydrothermal liquefaction facility using a sewage sludge uh, with bio crude upgrading to renewable diesel. Um, and um, uh, again, I'd like to mention that these are standalone. Um, they user friendly applications uh, that can be downloaded and used by anyone interested in estimating these uh, socioeconomic parameters. Um, Enel also per performs a, a life cycle um, assessment or analysis of greenhouse gas emissions and um, energy use. Um, LCA is a systematic uh, analytical method uh, that used to account for uh, inputs such as raw material and energy and outputs, uh, products, uh, waste materials and so forth to um, uh, various uh, systems. It's also used to qualify the environmental benefits and drawbacks of a process. Uh, it's used to perform um, a cradle to grave or all process, a resource to, extra to extraction uh, uh, type of um, uh, um, uh, sort of analysis. Um, it's ideal for comparing uh, new technologies uh, to the status quo. Uh, it also helps to pinpoint areas that deserve special attention. And it also reveals some unexpected environmental um, impacts that, um, again, um, were not previously um, identified. Uh, variables, variables that uh, we include in our LCAs uh, include green uh, gas emissions, um, uh, air pollutants, water contaminants and water use, uh, net energy value, uh, fossil fuel requirements uh, and land use. Um, the graph to the right illustrates an example of a very recent study, literally it was just published a few days ago, uh, that compares um, conventional uh, jet fuel uh, with uh, waste-based jet fuel produced from uh, food waste and uh, fat cells and greases. Uh, well, um, just uh, I don't have time, unfortunately, to spend more uh, uh, time on this uh, particular project, but I would like to just say that while um, the well to pump emissions, which is marked in blue um, from food waste jet fuel pathway are very high. Um, and this because the process uses large amounts of natural gas, electricity and hydrogen. Uh, those emissions are actually at the end uh, offset by the avoided emissions, which are colored in gray, um, associated with diverting food waste from landfills. Um, the hydro processing, um, which expects to fog, uh, as you can see, it's a very small um, as emission associated with the well to pump um, uh, a sort of portion of the total LCA. Um, it is because the hydro processing technology um, uh, I mentioned earlier using fog to jet fuel is very efficient and also collecting and pre-processing of fog um, uses very small amount of energy um, and therefore the pathway um, has a, a small wheel to um, wheel uh, to pump, I'm sorry, um, impact. Um, I would like to close um, uh, this uh, uh, sort of talk 
uh, with few additional uh, decision making support um, that we've been providing over the years. These include uh, providing uh, assistance with requests for proposal, um, development or uh, reviews, uh, uh, particularly in the case of renewable natural gas. Uh, we also review um, AD projects in terms of um, we're looking at business organizations and improvements uh, where it could be made um, uh, project uh, uh, technology uh, uh, costs and uh, tax basis, um, annual operations and so forth. Um, we've also um, evaluated acquisition feasibility of uh, uh, this type of projects, um, environmental uh, and uh, uh, other types of uh, uh, permitting, uh, co-product uh, markets and so forth. Uh, we've also um, have been very involved in uh, uh, strategic energy and resilience planning uh, for state, local and tribal communities. Um, and again, um, uh, it's, and we have been again working uh, with these communities uh, heavily uh, to support um, decision making and help them um, in, in their path to um, deploying um, um, an analysis related to uh, waste energy um, and uh, how to achieve their um, energy goals. Uh, with that, um, I will pass the mic to um, to Bo uh, to walk you through um, our uh, waste energy technical assistance with a little bit more um, uh, background on this um, uh, uh, sort of um, endeavor and uh, also walk you through the mechanics of it. Take it away, Bo. Amelia? Um, Thank you. So, uh, Neelia went through a lot of data and information. Um, and um, if you want to go to the next slide, please. Um, Ultimately, the goal of this program is to get that data, those analyses, um, these models, these tools out into the hands of you as local decision makers. Um, you know, as I alluded to earlier, uh, waste is a very local problem and the resource um, and energy recovery strategies are gonna be equally local. local. So um, it's well and good to do nationwide analysis, um, but we're at the stage now where it's really important to get that information um, into uh, local communities. So, um, so the purpose of this program is really to facilitate that. Uh, we've heard feedback over the last couple of years and asking the rhetorical question of how do I work with the labs? Um, and, and this is aimed to do just that. Um, in addition, we, we do want to foster local public-private partnerships. Um, you know, these types of um, uh, community uh, partnerships between the federal government, between a funding agency, and uh, between a municipality. Um, it also informs our strategy and um, helps us answer the question, are we investing in the right technologies? And are we solving the right problems? Um, so we're really excited about what we're going to learn on the, um, on the NREL and um, DOE sides. Um, as far as who is eligible to this program, um, all U.S. municipalities um, in the lower 48, um, Alaska, Hawaii, um, our U.S. territories such as Guam, uh, Puerto Rico, um, and tribal governments as well. Um, I'd also extend that. Um, we, um, we're also including this opportunity out to um, utilities owned by those municipalities. So for instance, a uh, sanitation district. Um, what does this cost to you? Um, uh, nothing. Um, that, is a key part of this. Um, we do want to lower the barrier to access of this information and these analyses. Um, and um, in that regard, there's no cost share that, um, that a municipality has to bring to this. Um, uh, if you're su uh, successful in, in being selected, um, you know, you will receive 40 hours of time from the subject matter experts um, at NREL, um, whom I will talk about later. Um, and you know, we, we do expect um, your community's involvement in those discussions and in that um, kind of scope of work. But, uh, but again, we don't, um, we're not requiring any sort of cast cost share or any sort of in-kind cost share. Um, next slide, please. So um, in Anelia's slide, she went over some of the types of analyses that have been conducted. And the goal is to offer a menu of options to communities um, to select from. Um, so uh, when the program launches on Monday, um, if, and perhaps some of you have visited the website, um, these are the types of um, options that you can choose from. Um, so I think this is maybe best illustrated with some examples. So uh, next slide, please. Um, so I've put together you know, some, some hypothetical uh, situations um, for example, a city might be in the prog 
in the process of preparing a climate action plan and is looking to quantify the greenhouse gas and other sustainability uh, footprints associated with their existing waste management practices. Um, that's certainly within scope. Um, you know, we definitely would welcome that type of proposal. Um, another community might be um, comparing several options for managing their food waste. Um, they might be looking at incineration, anaerobic digestion, composting, and potentially other solutions as well. Um, uh, in this capacity, um, you know, they're looking for techno-economic analysis support, cost-benefit analysis, and uh, jobs impacts. So again, you know, we would, um, uh, we being NREL, excuse me, um, would uh, employ, you know, a different maybe set of subject matter experts to help answer those questions, techno-economic analysts, um, uh, analysts familiar with those communities, um, and certainly um, technologists who are familiar with those, those technologies. And then finally, um, you know, a community might um, know that they want to do um, anaerobic digestion to produce renewable natural gas, but is, um, you know, curious about exploring, um, you know, renewable energy certificates, um, EPA RINs, and LCSS um, impacts. Um, you know, for instance, if you start to accept food waste, um, that can impact the RIN value um, by changing that from a, a D3 RIN to a D5 RIN. So, Again, we're um, uh, uh, we're trying to make a variety of menu of options available. Um, and I would also note that if you have a um, request that's related to organic waste but isn't included in this, um, we do encourage that as well. Uh, we, there is a box for other. Um, next slide, please. So um, I'm going to go through the timeline and the process for this um, uh, this solicitation, if you will. Um, here we are on March 18th with the informational webinar. Um, the application portal is going to open on Monday, um, Monday, March 22nd, and will be open for several weeks until April 9th. Um, I'll show a preview of what that um, application window looks like here shortly. Um, but again, that's designed to be pretty, um, we want to lower the barrier of entry to the national lab. So that that's not, um, for those who have applied for a, uh, funding opportunity announcement or a small business innovative research grant. Um, this is much shorter and less intensive than that. Um, once we receive the applications um, in mid-April, we will be um, working with third-party reviewers to assess uh, the merit and impact of the um, technical assistance proposals. And by late April, um, we intend to announce our phase one selections. Um, and shortly after that, uh, those, those projects will begin. Um, that will start with a call with the NREL team um, and the community to kind of establish um, the guardrails, the scope of work for the, the effort, um, with the ultimate objective of having these phase one projects complete by the end of this fiscal year. Um, I'll also note that um, we're hoping to do a phase two application window sometime in the summer. Um, that's gonna be subject to funding availability, of course, um, and I'll talk about that here shortly. Next slide. Um, so this is what uh, you can expect to see on Monday when this program launches. Um, of course, you have the information on the left about who is applying. Um, you'll see up on the top right the, um, uh, the check boxes that you can, can choose from that are relevant to your proposal. Um, and then we have three short fields that we're, we're asking you to, um, to fill out um, and you know, to provide information about what sort of request you're looking for um, and um, and you know in the bottom field um, how does this relate to your energy goals um, how does it relate to prior work that say your Department of Environmental Quality has has done and so on and so forth um, again we don't expect these to be long uh, responses uh, we um, we're modeling this in large part after the Office of Indian Energy and other technical assistance programs um, where you know the goal is that this does not require um, many hours of work from the municipality. Um, that's that at some point that becomes uh, counterintuitive um, and counterproductive. So um, so that's what you can expect to see on Monday. Um, next slide. Once we receive those proposals, um, as I mentioned, we'll be um, uh, soliciting reviewers um, for. Uh, to consider the merit and impact of those. Um, they will abide, of course, by conflict of interest and non-disclosure agreements. So 
um, any information you share, um, you know, you can rest assured that that will be uh, kept confidential. Um, and I've just listed here what the what the criterion are. Um, so with regards to merit, which will be half of the score, um, you know, we're looking to the extent to which you have explained um, and justified your request, how it's relevant to resource and energy recovery from waste, um, and uh, you know, making sure that your your team will be engaged in the process. Um, again, a, a key aspect of this program is that uh, we stand to learn a lot ourselves as the federal government from the community. So we want to make sure that this is a partnership and a two-way uh, two way street of collaboration. Um, with regards to impact, uh, which is the other half of the score, um, you know, we want to see how this, um, this analysis or this support would advance your local government needs and initiatives. Um, perhaps you have a, uh, the need to put together a climate action plan, um, and, you know, this would support that. Um, and we want to see how this complements, supplements, or, um, you know, backfills uh, expertise that maybe your community doesn't have. Um, and I won't read the rest, but um, again, you'll have access to this, um, this slide deck after, after the presentation, so you can certainly review this as you, as you think about your um, proposal. Um, next slide. Um, so in addition to the above criteria, um, uh, one thing as, as DOE that we, we employ um, is the use of what we call um, proposal um, or uh, program policy factors. Um, and this is something we, um, the selection official will apply for meritorious proposals. So for proposals that are deemed to be sufficiently, you know, flushed out, have the requisite impact, um, again, a, a key point of this program is to make sure that we are um, transecting the entire country um, in, in as many ways as we can uh, to, to mobilize these analyses. So we're looking at geographic diversity, community size diversity, um, the uh, demographic and economic statuses of that community, um, policy diversity in terms of, you know, the existence or not of landfill bans uh, and things of that nature. So um, these are things that we employ ultimately to make sure that we, um, you know, we're not just selecting one type of project. Um, next slide. So what happens after selection? So um, as I mentioned, we're hoping to announce these in April, um, the, the selectees, um, and they'll kick off with an initial call between the subject matter experts at NREL um, and, and your community. Um, so certainly we'll flush out more of the technical assistance request in more detail. Um, uh, we'll basically contract the, the correct expertise and relevant information um, and just kind of lay that all out at the start. Um, and then basically establish a timeline for the activities of that, uh, that request to be executed. Um, next slide. And, you know, likewise, for, for proposals that aren't necessarily selected, um, uh, for whatever reason that may be, um, it's still our goal and NREL's goal to provide existing analyses, data, and information that's relevant to your community efforts. So. Um, you know, we're, we'll fund as many of these partnerships as we can. For those that we can't fund, um, we are committed to making sure that you have the analysis, you have the models um, that already exist that are relevant to your work. Um, uh, we also will roll over um, those, uh, those proposals into the phase two program automatically. Um, you can, of course, modify it as, as appropriate, but, um, but we'll certainly consider it then as well. Um, next slide. And last but not least, um, uh, you know, just a few uh, frequently asked questions that we, um, you know, we've, we've learned from our colleagues in the Office of Indian Energy, um, in the uh, Federal Energy Management Program and Solar Office um, when they've run these sorts of technical assistance programs. Um, so I want to just highlight two here. Um, uh, the, the second question there, is there a formal agreement for this technical assistance? Um, no. Um, there's not. Uh, we don't. Um, we don't need to negotiate some sort of um, uh, true statement of work. Um, and again, the hope there is to save time from negotiations and um, uh, and you know, I mean, I don't mean this pejoratively, but 
try to avoid bringing in lawyers and cutting into that 40 hours of time. Um, uh, next slide, please. And then um, I want to highlight at the end, what is the difference between information on funding and financing? Um, so this, this assistance is provided to these municipalities. Um, however, the funding and these dollars will not actually flow to your community. Um, as the Department of Energy, we are funding the National Lab to provide um, the analysis support. And, you know, in turn, they will support you. Um, if you were selected, you're not, for instance, going to receive a, um, a grant through this, this program. Um, we do have other funding opportunities um, on the street currently, um, and I would be happy to talk about those more in the uh, question and answer. Um, next slide. Um, and we can skip to the next one. Um, last but not least, and I think these are the people who are going to make this program a success, um, are the tremendous subject matter experts from across NREL um, who, um, who we're bringing to bear in this effort. Um, you know, we have engineers, we have techno-economic analysts, we have experts in local and tribal governments, um, experts in anaerobic digestion, experts in um, life cycle analysis, financing, renewable natural gas. Um, and I'm very excited at the, you know, diversity of um, technical perspectives that we can bring to bear in this effort. So, um, and if your proposal is outside of the bounds of what we imagined it to be, there's 2,000 other employees at, at NREL that we can, we can find that uh, can suit your project. So, um, I'm very excited about this team and um, very grateful for their, uh, their involvement here. Um, with that, I think we will wrap up and pop over to the uh, question and answer uh, period. Thank you so much, Bo. And Anelia, I would welcome you, Anelia, to unmute yourself and to come back on camera. Um, now would be a great time to practice that layout function if you would like to view our presenters. Um, and I am going to. So we actually we're running low on time, so I just want to remind everyone that the um, the presentation and the recording will be made available. I entered the link in the chat box, so that will be available to you in the next couple of days. Um, and um, additionally, there were so many great questions that came in. Unfortunately, we don't have time to answer all of them. So um, we will do our best to get back to you offline to respond to as many questions as we can. And again, we just thank you so much for sending these phenomenal questions in. But to get started with our Q&A, we had several questions come in, Anelia and Bo, that had to do with just um, uh, people who are um, eligible for this group. And so I have a number of eligibility questions we would like to get started with. So the first one is, are startups or industry providing WTE products and services eligible? Mm, that's a good question. Emily, is my... Uh... Audio video coming in through well. Yes, <laughs> you might sound great. <laughs> good. Um, uh, good question. So, uh, and Bob, jump in at any time if you uh, want to chime in with uh, any sort of uh, um, sort of additional um, answers. Uh, this is again tailored specifically for local governments, municipalities, as, as Bo um, outlined, uh, uh, tribal governments, and so forth. Um, so we don't specifically have. Um, in other words, we also specify that any uh, facility that is owned by municipality uh, is also eligible. Uh, but uh, uh, again, a startup company perhaps can uh, partner uh, with the municipality and uh, uh, maybe uh, come up with an idea uh, to proceed together uh, jointly. Uh, but the request has to come primarily from a municipality. I hope that answers the question. And again, I'm happy to elaborate offline. Uh, sorry, we ran out of time. So it's a lot to cover. Um, but again, uh, if this doesn't answer your question, again, we're happy to. Uh, to provide additional information. Thank you, Anelia. So additionally, um, are state governments eligible applicants or just local governments? And then along with that, would councils of governments be able to apply or would the request have to come from cities and counties of the camp that the council of government serves? Mm, these are all great questions. Uh, Bo, do you want to take on that uh, for the state? Yeah, sure. Um, 
With regard to state entities, again, this is tailored towards individual municipalities. Um, uh, so, uh, I, you know, to be just kind of blunt, um, you know, a, let's say we're talking about Wisconsin, um, uh, the city of Madison could apply, but the state of Wisconsin Department, Department of Environmental Quality would not be an eligible applicant. Um, with regards to um, uh, council of, um, of governments um, or like council of cities, uh, we know that that's a common common thing. Um, uh, yes, I think that can be, um, that's certainly within the scope of this, because again, we're trying to target into local communities. So if you had, um, uh, you know, let's say we're talking about North Carolina, if we're talking about the, um, like the research triangle area, you know, in Durham, um, Raleigh, uh, communities are right together. Um, yes, I think that a joint proposal would be, um, could be appropriate. Wonderful, thank you. And then one last eligibility question. We had a question come in. Can people from other countries participate in this project? Yep, that's a good question. Um, <laughs> this is limited um, to the United States and um, its territories and, um, and the tribal governments um, uh, therein. Um, so uh, short answer is no. Okay, thank you so much. Um, I know that we are out of time, and so we are unfortunately going to have to defer to answering the rest of these questions offline. Um, but I will pass it over to Anelia and Bo to wrap us up. And just a reminder, we will do our best to get back to you, and the recording will be made available shortly. I will place the link in the chat box once more. But Anelia and Bo, feel free to wrap up the event. Uh, thanks, everyone. I would like to say, um, Emily, if possible, uh, and uh, uh, Kathy, uh, thanks again uh, uh, to people who have been very involved in setting this up today. Um, perhaps we can also add uh, the questions that came up during the uh, webinar today, add them to our frequently asked questions uh, online uh, so um, everyone can see them um, and uh, uh, sort of see the answer. But we can, we're happy to follow up with, uh, with the individuals who have uh, um, asked them as well. Uh, thanks, everyone. Um, this is really exciting. Um, I appreciate everybody taking the time. Yep, again, thank you for taking the hour uh, this morning um, or this afternoon. Um, we're very excited about this program. Um, we're, we're excited to learn to build these partnerships with the communities um, and, uh, and get this data and information out to you so you can, can make the impact. So um, we look forward to seeing what you propose over the coming weeks. and. Um, and yes, as, as Amelia mentioned, um, questions that we can, we will put into that frequently asked questions um, uh, document on the, uh, the technical assistance webpage. Um, and so certainly check that out if you have questions. But again, please, please keep them coming. They, lots of good, uh, I see lots of good ones in there. So thank you everybody. Thank you.